We live in a broken world, we follow a broken Messiah, and we are restored through a broken bread. That is the theological message of today, of World Communion Sunday. Regardless of any events that are happening in our world, this is a day that is celebrated throughout the world uh, to remember Holy Communion and remember how we are in fact connected through this sacrament. So that's why we have all these various breads here today, breads from around the world, from Europe, from uh, South and Central Mexico, uh, uh, Central America and Mexico to remind us of the beautiful particular diversity of God's people. And how God self, the universality of God, is made manifest through the particular. In this case, through bread and wine, but also uh, through people as well. So we come here today to worship, to celebrate communion, and to remember again that the universal, the great, the all-encompassing God of the universe is made manifest and can be experienced through the particulars of bread and wine and through the particulars of people. God was embodied incarnationally through Jesus. That's the message of Christmas time. And when we celebrate communion, we are sort of remembering that message too. We remember that that the universal God is made manifest through particular people. As Jesus said in the 25th chapter of Matthew, when you love the least, the lost, and the forgotten, you don't just sort of love God. You literally love God in that moment. The universal God through the particular. I've been captured a lot this week about this idea about the universal and the particular as we think about uh, what's been happening in our city. Uh, there is a lot that's been going on. There's a lot swirling around. There are big universal issues that are far beyond you and me and the people here in Dallas, Texas. There are issues of race and class and gender, policing policies, the treatment of people of color by the police. There are big issues that we experience differently depending on who we are. If you might extend the metaphor, depending on what kind of bread we are. We see these issues very differently. And we are shaped by, our response rather, is shaped by who we are and what we experience. We bring our particular to these big universal questions that are swirling around. I got to tell you, it's been a tough week to be online and to watch the news. Yes, it's not easy to see these big universal conversations taking place about things a couple of miles from here. You know, we've been drawing that mile and a half circle for our mission field here in Kessler Park in North Oak Cliff. If you extend that out just a mile more, two and a half miles, Everything that happened in that case happened just down the road, right? And so there are particular people that maybe even some of us know, and they're, they're sort of in the media. When something big like this happens in the media, it, it begins to feel like the Hunger Games. You remember that movie and those books? Like the whole world is sort of looking in at actual people uh, it, playing this, this game, this deathmatch game with each other. It sort of felt like that this week, that the, the whole world was looking in on our city and on us, looking at these big universal questions through stuff that's literally happening in our neighborhood. But there are also particulars, particular human beings that were involved in this case. Botham Jean and his family, Amber Geiger and her family, a judge and attorneys and witnesses, and God bless them, the jurors, and all the people who have been listening in or who are connected to people connected to the case. So I had uh, the uh, great honor, privilege, of being with uh, Botham Jean's family on Friday morning, uh, in their final public appearance here in the city. There was a press conference at Michael Waters Church 
uh, co-sponsored by Faith Forward Dallas, of which I am a part, an interfaith group here in town. And it was deeply moving to me to see the particulars of that family as people, not just as a media story, but to literally see them in the flesh and to be in their presence. I could sense their exhaustion, their weariness, the the deer in the headlights eyes of, of Brant John as the entire world is now talking about him as an 18-year-old young man. Uh, but I also had a profound sense of awe at their deeply quiet strength uh, as they left our city and went back to St. Lucia. And of course, there's also Amber Geiger. She is a particular human being with a family, with a history. And we all, no doubt, feel great sympathy for her. Police have a hard job each and every day. Every day they walk out the door. They live in fear for their life and so do their families. So this is my opinion. Whatever sympathy we have for her, and I have great sympathy, I think the jury got it right in the verdict. I believe justice has been done, and I hope that this could perhaps a new era for justice, not just in our city, but maybe in our world. I am not quite sure this is a new day. There are some people announcing that this is a new day. Uh, many of my friends very quickly reminded us of how unique this case was. So the metaphor that came to my mind is maybe not a new day, but maybe it's the first light of a new day. You know, the rabbis in the rabbinical tradition in Judaism uh, were once asked, how do you know that it is a new day? And their answer was, you can tell it's a new day when you can see the light of the sun on every human face. That is when you know it's a new day. And so there are still people in our city and in our world for whom justice has not come. And it is not yet a new day. But maybe it's the dawning of that day. So uh, I was with uh, John, who just read our scripture uh, at uh, Oak Cliff Coffee. uh, When the verdict came, we were having this lovely, deep and spiritual conversation. And suddenly our phones blew up uh, at the verdict the other morning. And just after he left, I heard someone else in the coffee shop sort of let out a little whoop, which I felt confident was them hearing about the verdict. I don't tend to think personally that it is a time to celebrate in any way. I also don't think it's a time to judge anybody else's feelings about the verdict, however anyone felt about the verdict. I do am reminded of something my friend uh, Rabbi Andrew uh, Paley uh, said. Jonathan, I'm quoting a lot of Jewish people in the sermon today. I, you know, keep coming back to them. Rabbi Paley, who is a uh, rabbi at, uh, at Temple Shalom just across town, dear friend, just after the verdict reminded us of a story that's a midrash of, of the, the story of the Hebrews escaping from Egypt. And they crossed the sea and the waters uh, cave in on the Egyptian army, which is, of course, in a sense, a, a moment of justice. And in the text, it says that the Hebrew people rejoiced. But the Midrash teaching of the rabbis says that at that moment, God looked down and said to the Hebrew people, why are you celebrating when my children lay dead? Justice in this case still reminds us that there is justice still to be done and that there is pain that comes in a decision like this. Amber Geiger is God's child and we should feel compassion for her. But the mere fact that Botham Jean needed justice in the first place is also a reminder of which God cries out for. In our broken world, far too often, unarmed people are still shot by the police. In his specific case, sitting on his own couch, eating a bowl of ice cream, watching TV. 
That's what I keep coming back to. That's what I can't escape as I go over this over and over. No one deserves to be shot sitting on their couch eating a bowl of ice cream. Shouldn't happen to anyone at any time, which is why I think this verdict was right. But it is important for us to quickly recall that for many people in color, of color, it still feels like there's too little justice for people like Botham. My friend, Reverend Michael Waters, reminded us this week, pretty forcefully, that Botham Jean was, from the media's point of view, almost a perfect subject for them. He was beloved by the company he worked for. He sang in the church choir beautifully, so beautifully that his neighbors could hear him as they walked down the hall. Almost a, a perfect ex universal example. But Michael Waters very quickly reminded me that until justice is done for imperfect victims, we still have a long way to go and it is not a new day. And I think he's right. Perhaps you saw the amazing moment of forgiveness. I feel confident you saw the amazing moment of forgiveness between Amber Geiger and Brant Jean. It has no doubt now been shared millions of times. It has gotten a lot of press. It is the moment of the week that has been pulled out of this big story in our city and is being shared all over the world. I am confident you cried when you saw it. Yes? It was a beautiful moment of forgiveness. I was on the way to Methodist Hospital to see James Hopper after his surgery. I walked in. He was nearly in tears. He said, you won't believe what's just happened. And then I, I sat and I, I watched it on my phone. And we sat there together marveling at that moment. If you didn't cry over that moment, I'm not sure. Come see me this week. We need to talk. <laughs> we, need, we really need to talk. That uh, our district super uh, district attorney, not superintendent, <laughs> district attorney said this week in 37 years in criminal justice, he's never seen a moment like that. That's how rare it was. As Christians, as people of faith, we are absolutely to strive for those sort of particular moments. I have no idea if I could do what he did in that moment. I also know I must not expect that from anyone. That is a movement of God that he chose in that moment. And here again, we, we come back to the particular and the universal. Brant is a particular human being forgiving another particular human being. I heard him say uh, with my own ears on Friday when I met him, he had no idea the TV cameras were still on, by the way. He really didn't. He thought, he thought they were done. It was not a part of the official trial. It's the victim impact statement. He sincerely and legitimately thought he was talking person to person to Amber Geiger and offering his personal forgiveness. I only offer that to, as, a, as just an, another example of how remarkable it was. And the whole world has picked up on that as a remarkable thing. And it is a remarkable thing. It makes it still very spiritually courageous. We are called to that by God, no doubt. I hope that's why you wept. I hope you wept because probably in your life, you have particular people you need to forgive, maybe still. And, and you think about that and what it means to receive it and to give it. But let's be clear of what that moment was not. It was not a universal forgiveness of all the racial sins of the past of our nation. It was not a forgiveness for all the shooting of unarmed civilians who still don't have justice. It was not a universal act at all. That's my point. It was a very beautiful personal act that have implications for all of us in how we should live. We can learn a great deal about forgiveness from it and we should. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I know you cried when you saw that. I'll tell you, the first time I cried during the trial this week was not at that moment. It was a couple of days before when a young man named Joshua Brown testified. Joshua Brown was a neighbor of Botham John's, lived across the hall. 
And he was on the stand and he was talking a little about what a lovely person Botham was. And one of the things he said as he testified on the stand was how he could hear Botham John singing gospel hymns every morning as he walked out of his apartment across the hall from Botham. And he thought about that for a minute and then Joshua Brown just started and they had to stop the trial for a moment. And I started weeping because I I understood how personal this was for him. And I had to imagine that in some sense he thought to himself, there but by the grace of God go I, I live across the, apart, uh, the hall from all of these events that could have been me. Have you heard the news? Joshua Brown was, was murdered Friday night here in, in Dallas. Joshua Brown, that young man who testified... It's almost unbelievable. There is no clear evidence of a perpetrator or a motive. I don't want to speak to that at all. I simply want to point out the obvious that black and brown lives in our city are still at greater risk than those of us who are white. It may be a new morning, but it is not yet a new day. So if we share tears of compassion for masterful acts of forgiveness which speak to us all, we are also called to still stand with those who shed tears of grief for justice denied or delayed, for those who are still at risk on our street. And so when I think of this, I think of Alison John Botham's mother. And in her final comments, she made that point very clearly. Yes, personal forgiveness, absolutely. But let's finish the job of really calling for justice for all of God's children. Uh, she was asked in the press conference on Friday, Alice and John, Botham's mother, uh, what words do you want to see? As you leave our city, what words do you want to see from our city leaders? You know what she said? She said, I don't want to hear any words. I want to see action." Ouch. She's right. It's what I pray before the sermon every week. Let us not just hear a word with our heart and our mind and our ears. Let us hear a word that compels us to action, to compassion, to love, to justice for all. I would hope, therefore, that we understand that there is much more to be done. And what I'm saying in the end is I think we must listen to both the son and the mother. That's what we're called to do here as the church. Yes, absolutely to personal forgiveness. God bless it. It changes our lives. But also to continuing call for justice and compassion for the least and the lost and the forgotten. We still live in a broken world. We still follow a broken Messiah. And we are renewed for this work by the broken bread. So I would hope that we have compassion for all. I I hope that we continue to call for uh, reform uh, among our uh, police officers, not simply for civilian sake, but also for theirs. I hope that we can find different ways they might engage the public that keep them, the police, safer. Uh, They deserve to be safe. Uh, And the way they encounter the public deserves to be a, a training that keeps them and the public safe. I hope we can work for that. I hope we can ask some questions about the many cases over the past 50 years since the last police conviction that are still out there with question marks and the many other grieving families just like the Jean. We can ask that. How can we bring justice for them? And finally, I believe we end where we began. We live in a broken world. We follow a broken Messiah. And we share the broken bread. Jesus' life was broken by the powers that be of His day. But God took a broken moment 
And God transformed it and brought new life out of it. Jesus' death did not have to happen, but happened because of the power of our world, which is always bringing suffering and pain. We are always, as human beings, bringing suffering and pain to one another. But God redeems that. God says no to our brokenness and brings new life. I think that's what the Jean family is doing for us. We can never fully redeem their heartbreak. We can't. That's up to God and their spirit. But we can, through what we do in this city and what we do as people of faith, we can partially redeem it. And we are called to do that as well. We are called to continue to live as both people of personal forgiveness and societal justice. That, friends, that will also help to redeem their suffering. I believe that God is speaking to us through that family and that something positive can still be born. This is not yet a new day, but it is the dawning of a new day. Let us work for that time where just like these different breads, we can see the beautiful faces of all those in our city and county and love them and keep them safe as God's beloved children. Amen?